Dr. Ted Venema Talks Audiology, the educational whiteboard series brought to you by Next Gen Hearing. Hi, I'm Ted Venema, here to talk to you today about testing infants and children. It's a whole different kettle of fish from the regular mainstream adult testing. Why is it so important? Pediatric audiology is a real subspecialty. And why is it so important to test infants, babies, kids, children? The reason why is because of language acquisition. Speaking is all about hearing. If a child isn't be able, able to hear language and the sounds of his or her language, he or she isn't going to acquire the regular milestones of language development. So amplifying properly with hearing aids is often done as soon as the hearing loss is noticed in an infant. This can be done at a month or two of age. Pediatric audiometry can be broken down into behavioral testing and non-behavioral testing. I mean, after all, a baby isn't about to wear headphones and raise his little hand every time he or she hears a tone. In fact, they're more apt to wipe off the ugly headphones. They're not going to be doing the regular hearing test that you can do with an adult. Hearing testing for babies is behavioral or non-behavioral, and this means it's either a voluntary or a response type of test seen in visual movement of the baby and the baby's behavior, or else it's a test of a reflex or a startle response like an eye blink. The whole thing about pediatric audiometry is that the test has to be valid and it has to be reliable. These two words are quite important when it comes to testing a test. Validity means, is the test really assessing what it says it's assessing. Is it testing what it says it's testing? It's the ac it, it reflects accuracy of a test. Reliability, on the other hand, is will the same test on the same patient yield the same results again and again and again? So validity and reliability are two things you want to achieve in a hearing test, and especially so for the infant who cannot tell you what he or she hears. Behavioral tests can be broken down into their very subs various subsets, and so can non-behavioral tests. And I'll go through all of these with you. It's really quite the science. Figure one is showing you visual reinforcement audiometry, also known as VRA. This is a behavioral type of test, and it involves conditioning, stimulus response. You'll see in the figure a room with two speakers, one in each corner, and you'll see where the mother or father or caregiver and the baby is sitting in his or her lap. Now the baby and the, and the caregiver are sitting in a chair and they're facing speakers, one in each corner of the room. Behind the wall is a piece of glass or whatever, and behind that glass sits the examiner, and the examiner is presenting tones through one of the speakers. Now it's important to look at that middle box in the front of that figure, because that middle box is showing you uh, the reinforcer. It has a little toy monkey or a little stuffed doll that's jumping up and down with flashing lights, and that's the reward the baby gets every time he or she responds to tones coming from the speaker. So a tone or a, will be coming out of the speaker, out of one of the speakers, at a, right, at a volume level that's regular, you know, average volume level that a normal listener would well be able to hear. And if the baby responds to look at that, where that's coming from, right away, ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding, the little monkey is made to jump up and down and lights are flashing in the little middle box. And the baby is, looks at that, wow, okay, <laughs> and laughs or whatever. And then silence follows, and then from the other speaker, the same tone is presented again. This time, if the baby responds again, -a 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 -a, he or she is reinforced by that little dancing monkey with the bright flashing lights. If the whole thing is setting up a stimulus response paradigm. That's why they call it visual reinforcement audiometry. Now from here, the tones are progressively lowered in their decibel level of intensity. And we keep trying to see if the baby will respond and then be reinforced by that little monkey. So the softest level at which that baby responds is seen to be as close to the baby's hearing levels or hearing sensitivity for that particular stimulus that came out of the speaker. 
The whole thing though is, note that the baby wasn't wearing headphones. And when you're not wearing headphones, you can't tell which ear it was that heard those tones. And so findings are often reported as, hearing was within normal limits for at least the better ear. Subsequent testing when the baby gets a little older will help delineate which ear it was. Behavioral testing can also be done at a higher level when the ch child attains the age of about two years and becomes a toddler. Now the child will be able to wear headphones and now you can play games and the examiner has to really be good at testing that child in a non-threatening and a really playful manner. One way to do it is to have the child wear the headphones sitting in his or her mom's lap or dad's lap there and the examiner is across behind the glass again this time facing the child and in a really pleasant playful way says show me your nose presented over the right ear or the left ear, and we try to cover our faces too so the baby isn't really lip reading, but show me your nose, and if the baby responds, good, or the child responds, great. Show me your ears, and if the baby does this, okay, you know the child heard. So the level at, uh, at which the sound, which your voice is sent over the earphone or headphones is progressively lowered again until the child no longer is able to respond. This can be done separately for the right and left ears and thereby you can get an idea as to how soft the child can hear speech in right or left ears. Yeah, but what about getting more frequency specific? Well, tones can now be presented as well through the headphones like that. And we, we have a game, it's called Play Audiometry. The child can wear the headphones and be given a, a bunch of blocks and every time, and the child can hold a block up by his or her ear, every time the tone is presented, put the block into the pail. Now do it with this ear. Every time the tone is presented, put the block in the pail. And the tones can be progressively lowered and lowered again until the, the child is no longer able to do it. Sometimes the child will hold a peg in his or her hand and then will put the peg into, into a board that will hold the peg. Whatever it takes, it's called play audiometry, done under headphones. This is yet another behavioral type of testing for toddlers and children. But when we move into the non-behavioral sector of in infant audiometry or pediatric audiometry, this is a whole different thing and it complements the behavioral series of tests. Non-behavioral testing of children can involve tympanometry and acoustic reflexes and figure two will show you autoacoustic emissions and we'll look at that and a third type of test is the auditory brainstem response test. I'll go over each of these. Tympanometry we covered in another whiteboard session, but tympanometry involves a probe inserted into the ear canal and that probe needs to, uh, we need to have an airtight seal so that you've got a hermetically sealed ear canal. A low pitched tone is emitted out of the probe and we measure how much sound is bouncing back off the drum as a result of changing the air pressure in that ear canal with that same probe. So that probe's got three holes. One is a speaker to emit a tone, a second one is a, a, a microphone to pick up what bounces back, and a third hole in that probe is it allows air pressure changes. And of course, this requires an airtight seal in the ear canal. Now, tympanometry is great at assessing if someone has middle ear pathology, because for the middle ear to be most efficient, air pressure's gotta be easy even on both sides of that drum. And if that's the case, you've got normal middle ear function. So tympanometry is able to track the course of the stages of otitis media from early to later on fluid filled otitis media. But a subset, so that can help to rule out middle ear pathology in an infant, a toddler, a child, but a subset of tympanometry is called acoustic reflex testing. This involves the same probe inserted in the ear canal, but now, instead of changing air pressure, you're presenting a loud tone through that, through that probe. And we measure, is there a change in the amount of sound bouncing off the drum as a result of that loud sound being presented? And if so, if there is a change in the amount of sound bouncing off the drum, 
in response to the loud tone coming out of the probe. If that's the case, we've got what we call an acoustic reflex. The two little muscles, the tensor tympani and stapedius muscle pulling on the middle ear ossicles. And that is also a test of hearing. And if you've got acoustic reflexes, you know you're testing the entire auditory system. The sound from the outer ear through the middle ear to the cochlea, up the eighth nerve to the brain stem, and then the reflex pulling the seventh and the fifth cranial nerves or activating them to pull the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles. So that is a, a test, but it doesn't really tell you much about the degree of hearing loss. It assesses if the middle ear function is normal and acoustic reflexes are, are noted, are they similar to what they would be in a normal hearing person or not. It, it, it gives a good idea of middle ear health and status, but it doesn't really give you a great idea of the degree of loss. Behavioral testing is better that way, but you can't always get behavioral tests. And so these non-behavioral tests serve as a great complement to the behavioral tests. A second non-behavioral test is shown in figure two. This is called autoacoustic emissions or OAEs. OAEs are a relative newcomer to the playing field of non-behavioral audiometry. What we do here is we put a probe in the ear canal just like we did with tympanometry, but the probe doesn't have to be airtight. Rather, the main condition is that the room is fairly quiet in ambient noise. Now, this probe also has three little holes. One's a speaker, and the second one is a speaker, and the third one, the third one is a microphone that picks up what, bounce, what comes off the, out of, uh, off the eardrum and gets picked up by that probe. So with autoacoustic emissions, two different frequencies are sent out. These frequencies have to be separated by a specific ratio. It's been well researched. Frequency one and frequency two, a lower and a higher tone separated by a specific ratio of its one to 1.22 to be exact. Anyway, those are sent out at around 65 and 50, 55 dB SPL respectively. And those tones are sent out and as a response, a third tone is picked up by the microphone. Now this tone, it's important to note, isn't bouncing back off the drum or being reflected off the eardrum as in tympanometry. On the contrary, they actually, that third tone picked up by the mic is actually originates from the cochlea itself, specifically from the outer hair cells of the cochlea. You see, the cochlea is an amplifier. Outer hair cells serve to amplify soft sounds so that inner hair cells can process them and send them up to the brain. So inner hair cells by themselves can't pick up sounds softer than about 50 dB. They need the outer hair cells to help them pick this up. So the outer hair cells serve like an internal amplifier. The cochlea as an amplifier, well, all amplifiers produce some distortion, and the cochlea is no exception. And this distortion product is that third tone that's picked up by the microphone in the probe. So it's been well-researched, autoacoustic emissions. So now if you cannot pick up an autoacoustic emission, well, your outer hair cells aren't functioning properly. Houston, you've got a problem. The child has a hearing loss. But once again, the flaw of this test is it's not very good at telling degree of hearing loss. It just, it's a great screener for telling does the child have normal hearing or not. Tympanometry, acoustic reflexes, autoacoustic emissions. Great tests, but not so great at telling degree of loss. A third test, if you look on figure three, this shows the auditory brainstem response, also known as the ABR. Now the ABR is quite good at assessing the degree of one's hearing loss. So the ABR involves, you'll see this infant in the picture, laying there with an electrode taped on one ear and also on the other ear. Electrodes are taped on, one, on both ears. A third one serves as a ground on the forehead and headphones are placed in the infant's ears. The infant has to be fairly quiet, sometimes sedated, otherwise just after mom has nursed the baby, that's a good time as well when the baby's quiet. 
And sounds are delivered into the right ear first and later on the left ear. Now these sounds are quite interesting. They're not tones. They have to, see the brainstem responds quite quickly, immediately after a tone is presented. I mean the neural distance is quite close. So the stimuli have to be very brief in duration and very sudden in their onset. These are known to be as clicks. Sometimes they're called tone bursts. Well, these sounds are presented in rapid succession in the ear canal. And all the while, the electrodes on the ears are measuring the baby's brainstem response to the stimuli. The ABR looks like a series of waves. To be precise, five specific peaks. Look at the right-hand side of the figure. You'll see peaks one through five. Typically, they are labeled in Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, and five. These peaks show up very well on the computer screen, provided the sound is audible to the person. The sounds are progressively made softer and softer, and the ABR begins to change its shape. It morphs a bit. The peaks get a little smaller, and they get a little more delayed. Their latency increases, and the examiner determines what decibel level, at what decibel level did, the fi did finally the ABR just disappear. That level is taken to be fairly close to the infant or the baby's threshold. So the ABR, which kind of came out in the mid-1980s, a slightly older test, but it, again, it's a very useful test. This test is used along with the others, but this test, the unique thing is that it shows the degree of loss. So it's a test battery that is normally done in pediatric audiology or audiometry. And I hope that this can give some appreciation as to the unique skills required to accurately, to reliably and validly test a child, infant, or baby. Pediatric audiometry, it's a real subspecialty. And the importance of fitting children and infants cannot be overestimated. The earlier proper amplification can be provided, the better the chances are that the child will acquire their normal milestones of language development. Thanks for listening. See you next time.